This is Bucket Talk, a weekly podcast for people who work in the trades and construction that aren't just trying to survive, but have the ambition and desire to thrive. The opportunity in the trades and construction is absolutely ridiculous right now. So if you're hungry, it's time to eat. We discuss what it takes to rise from the bottom to the top with people who are well on their way and roll up their sleeves every single day. On this episode of Bucket Talk, we have Billy Cornelius. He is our uh, timber sports athlete. We just signed him this year. Um, hell of a guy. But we're going to go deep into the world of nurseries and forest management and then on to the world of timber sports. Billy, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Glad to be uh, here. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So you joined us um, early this year. You came down to the Brunt Garage. Um, we talked about doing a Timber Sports sponsorship, longtime Brunt supporter. Um, we jumped into that world of, of uh, you know, from Woodsman's Day up in Freiburg to the Steel uh, Championship out in uh, Milwaukee. Yep. And uh, But one of the cool things we never really got to dive into is your day job and how you got into it. Um, Kind of go as far back as, uh, you know, high school, childhood, how you how you chose this path um, and what you do on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's kind of funny. Uh, I kind of came to forestry and timber sports kind of in a pretty indirect uh, way. Um, and so early on, you know, I mean, I grew up like basically living outside all the time out in the woods. Uh, you know, hunting, fishing with my dad, um, you know, pretty much outside all the time, you know. Um, I always remember, I think it was when I was either eight or nine, I saved up my allowance money and I went down to the hardware store and I bought myself a little hatchet and, uh, you know, and I went out and I, I cut my first tree down, right? And then I like had a journal and I actually wrote about that in my journal. I was like, oh, I bought an ax and today I cut a tree down. Um, yeah. you know, and that was like a big thing for me. Um, but, you know, growing up, uh, I actually got into agriculture, um, helped a lot of buddies do haying and stuff, you know, in my teenage years. Um, and then uh, when I graduated high school, you know, like I wasn't about uh, just going to college, right? Like most kids just go to college. Um and I was like, I really don't know what I would go to college for. So, you know, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to work, um, you know, because at that point, I just didn't really get the point of why you would want to go to college. Yeah. Uh, so I actually went and worked on a dairy farm uh, for about four and a half years, uh, milking cows, uh, you know, helping with all the crop work, um, you know, anything on the farm. And um after about four, four and a half years, you know, the, the farmer was like, Hey, you know, this is like the maximum of what I can pay you. Um, and I was like, Oh, okay. You know, like, well, that's not going to be enough to live on. <laughs> and, um, you know, at that time I was also had gotten into maple sugaring, um, on the side, you know, and was doing a couple hundred taps on my own, um, you know, and selling the syrup and, uh, so I had a big interest in maple sugaring. And so I was like, well, I was like, maybe I should go back to college. Um, and started kind of looking at some different college stuff and uh, found a forest technology program down at the University of New Hampshire, um, just an associate's program. And, uh, you know, and I was like, wow, that really, really seems interesting. Like, you know, I can learn more about trees and maybe tie it into maple sugaring. Um, so I, I wrote an email to the professor, uh, chatted with him, and uh, ended up signing up uh, to go to college. So there I was, a uh, freshman in college in 2008 at the age of 22, I think. Uh, you know, so about the time most kids would be graduating from college, I was just starting. Um, so it was an interesting experience being in with a bunch of 18-year-olds, but... Um, but yeah, so I went and uh, studied forestry there at the University of New Hampshire. Um, and then um, during that time also got 
uh, hooked up with the UNH Woodsman's team there. And that's kind of where my start of timber sports uh, came about. And, you know, we could probably touch on that a little bit later. Now that's, now that's crazy. Um, I want to unpack a few things early on. Yeah. Um, one of the, now we haven't touched like the early days um, because like, so my kids are looking at like 4-H or the FFA, the FFA programs and like the stuff early on. And I, I think there's a lot of parents that are listening to this and like, how do I get my kids involved in agriculture or livestock? Um, were you involved in any of those programs growing up? Like, um, you know, you said you had an affinity for agriculture and, and that, that way, but like, how'd you, how'd you go pursue that as a, as a young child? Was it just through like outdoor management with like hunting and fishing or was it more than that? Yeah. Um, no, I was, I was never part of, uh, 4-H or FFA or anything like that. Um, I was actually, uh, I went to public school through third grade and then I was actually homeschooled, uh, fourth grade all the way through high school. Okay. Uh, you know, so a little bit of a different situation there. Um, but yeah, never really did any 4-H or anything, but through the homeschool, uh, community, um, a lot of those folks were, were more into agriculture up here. Um, so some of our close friends, uh, you know, their boys were just a couple of years older than me and they all had, you know, old antique tractors and they were out doing haying and, um, you know, driving old Chevy single axle dump trucks and, uh, you know, loading hay in those. So, um, yeah, I yeah. got in with them and that was kind of how I got into the farming and, um, yeah, you know, just thought it was really good. I mean, it's, I've, I've always been someone who I work hard, you know, yeah. Yeah. so I'm not someone to just sit around on the couch and hard work has <laughs> always, uh, entertained me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what draws me to most of the things that I do is that it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, and then, um, another thing that I wanted to bring up um, was a lot of people talk about, um, not going to college because college is a waste of time. But what a lot of people don't realize is up here, UMaine, um, you know, UNH, and then obviously there's a, a lot of those in the upper Midwest and, and out West, but there's a lot of agriculture programs. There's a lot of, um, you know, livestock management programs, um, through these, uh, through these colleges. And I actually know a couple of buddies, a, a cow farmer friend of mine, um, got into the science side of, of cows and ended up working for, um, a company called IDEX and, uh, dealt in, in cow management and what have you. And that, and that worked alongside with what he did, um, at home managing a herd and, and producing, uh, beef cows. So that was pretty cool to see that like, Hey, you know, maybe a traditional college route might not be the, the, the way for you, but, um, there are a lot of ag programs and a lot of, uh, livestock management programs that are, that are at some of these colleges. So definitely something to keep an eye out for if that's, if that's the interest you want to go. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, definitely. And, and let me just jump back just a second to 4-H and FFA while I wasn't involved, um, you know, actually now with my job, I kind of get some involvement with 4-H and, you know, I, I really support, you know, 4-H FFA as, as like a way to get, get kids into agriculture, get them into the outdoors. And, and they also have such a wide array of programs that even go beyond agriculture, right? right? right. It's, it's delving more into electronics and stuff like that. So th those groups are definitely great. Um, yeah. And then, and then with college, um, you know, yeah, there, there's a lot of great colleges out there, um, you know, that have technical, more outdoorsy or, you know, mechanic type, um, you know, positions and, and programs that can help direct you in the right way. And, no, that's uh, you know, that was one of the things that really interested me about uh, the University of New Hampshire. And so I actually went to the Thompson School, right, which is their their associates um, program. And so the forestry program there, they've kind of altered it a little bit since I've been there. Um, but when I was there, 
you know, it was a two-year program. They required you to do an internship uh, in the summer in between the two years, so you're getting practical experience. And, you know, one of their big things that they touted was for every two hours that you spent in the classroom, you were spending four hours outside in a lab actually applying what you're learning. Um, and and it was it's one of those things of, in the general forestry and logging sawmill industry here in New, New Hampshire and New England, um, most uh, companies would rather hire someone with an associate's degree out of the Thompson School than they would someone out of a four-year program uh, just because someone could graduate from the Thompson School and they've done so much hands-on lab work that they could go and basically go to work the first day that they show up on a new job. Um, you know, whereas a four-year student a lot of times spends a lot more time actually learning stuff in the classroom, but they haven't gotten the chance to apply that. Um, so that's that's what I love about the Thompson School and about some of those community colleges and smaller programs is it allows you to apply and then you can translate that into the workforce much quicker. All right, so selfishly, um, there's there's a uh, a part of your upbringing that I really want to get into. And for those who have been up in the Northeast, the New England area, and I don't know how far it goes um, across the country, but um, around this time of year, you'll see tubes running from tree to tree. And um, you're like, what the heck is that? Well, um, they're actually tapping the maples to then draw the... I, I don't even know what you call it. Is it just because you boil it down into sugar, but yeah, what, just is sap. it just sap? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so the sap runs down gravity fed to usually like a sugar shack or something like that where it's collected and then boiled off. And uh, so for, up here it's maple syrup and um, I've always wanted to do it, but never understood the process. How'd you get into that? That's like, I mean, that's something yeah. I definitely want to do. I yeah. tapped the wrong tree or something, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I could come up and identify it for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so so just a quick correction. Uh, maple sugaring season is actually in the spring. Oh, okay. Uh, not in the fall. So. Um, but, but once the leaves fall, you can see a lot of the tubing and stuff, so it, it kind of catches your eye, or you can't see it in the summertime. Thank, thanks for thanks for covering my ass on that. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, I mean, I got started in that um again through the homeschool community. So we had some friends who uh did some maple sugaring, and I think you know, geez, I mean, that, that's a long time ago now, but um, I can't remember if we went over to their place and saw them doing it, and uh, I got interested that way. Yeah. Or what exactly it was, but um. You know, I, I started small, um, got a little flat pan, I think it was like a two by two uh, flat pan, had it up on some cinder blocks and just lit a fire underneath it and had about 10 trees tapped and, you know, boiled down uh, syrup. And um, I think uh, the, the one thing with maple sugaring is that you either try it and you're like, this is way too much work. I'll just go buy it at the store. Yeah. Or yeah. you try it and then you're like, this is really cool. Um, and then the problem is, is that you continue to get bigger. Um, and so that's what happened with me. You know, I started with 10 taps that maybe lasted one or two years. And then I jumped up to 25 and then I jumped up to 100. And then, you know, I went out and bought like an actual professional evaporator um, you know, and built myself a little sugar house. And then I jumped up to like 150 and then 200 <laughs> taps. Right. So it's like, it's one of those things that it's like, you just get the bug and it's, and it's one of those processes where, you know, it takes a long time. And that's, that's the thing, right. With a little flat pan, like what you would probably do in your backyard, it would take, you know, it takes a long time because it takes, at least 40, you know, usually 40 to 50 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. So most people just doing a few taps in their backyard aren't even going to make a gallon of syrup, you know. But then I'm like, well, I could be sitting out here for eight hours on my Saturday, or probably more like 10 or 12, honestly, and 
I could make a quart of maple syrup, or I could be sitting out here with a big rig and lots of taps, and I could sit out here for 10 hours and I could make 10 gallons of syrup. And I'm like, well, what, what sounds more efficient to me, you know? So it's like, might as well get bigger. <laughs> That's, that's, yeah. the best wow. it's, it's, it's funny. Cause that's where I am with like egg production right now is just like, you know, a couple of chickens wasn't enough. So then we like went all in and now we have more eggs than we know what to do with. And we're giving them away. And yeah. Um, yeah. it's, it's wild because I could only imagine that that's where you you were at with, uh, with sugaring is like, you're just giving out gallons. There's not yeah. enough pancakes for you to put them on. Right. Yeah, yeah. But then it was funny because then I ended up going to college, you know, and I kind of studied forestry because of my interest in maple sugaring. And then I was so busy at college, I ended up not maple sugaring. I sold all my stuff and I've never done it since then. <laughs> oh, no. so, but at the same time, I've thought about it a couple of times and I'm like, it's going to be the same situation, right? I'll be like, oh, I'm just going to do 20 taps, and then the next thing I'll have a thousand, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, fast forward, you know, you graduated um, the Thompson School, and you're now in forestry management. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? Like, what is what is that involved? Uh, like, I'm just trying to understand it. Like, are you planning out forests? Are you know, I know a little bit, um, my wife was in the hardwood flooring industry and she did, um, yeah. um, you know, their wood products came from Pennsylvania, which was you like my cat joined the podcast. Um, the, so it, it was funny because they talk about like deforesting and, and you know, how it's, how it's a bad thing. And, but a lot of these, a lot of these sustainable forests, um, they actually have a plan for regenerative growth for it to be. Um, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of, um, people that own woods will find out that like, you can put it in agriculture, uh, zoning, and then you could have like a forest management plan and yep. there's like different degrees. Like just because it's a forest full of trees doesn't mean it's a healthy forest. And I'm sure you can go into that and, and, uh, what you do on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you hit a lot of the nails on the head there. Um, and summed it up but uh yeah i mean we could do two podcasts on this easy but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up into a few minutes but um but yeah um yeah so kind of moving out of uh college so i had done an internship with a uh, logging company who also had an on-staff forester mm -hmm. um and so i worked with their forester for that summer in between actually worked with them a little bit during my senior year of college. Um, and when I graduated, he offered me a full-time job, um, you know, as their second forester. So um, I was like, perfect. I mean, you know, I'm graduating college and here's someone offering me a job. So um, I jumped in and so, yeah, so that was uh, doing private forestry there. And um, so, yeah, what we do is, is we, we'd work with landowners, right? So landowners would contact us and, and the company I was working for was kind of sort of like a one-stop shop, right? So they would talk to uh, me or the other forester as um, kind of the land management team and we would meet with them. Um, you know, and the first thing is, is that every landowner has goals for their property, mm -hmm. right? So you know, it's just getting to know the landowner, getting to know their land and being like, you know, what are your goals? Um, you know, are your goals to generate, uh, like solely generate revenue from your land from producing timber? Uh, is it that, you know, you're into deer hunting or turkey hunting and you want to promote wildlife habitat um, so that you have more deer on your property? Um, you know, do you want hiking trails because you like to just hike around your land? Um, but it's also not that simple, right? Because it's not just most landowners have multiple goals, right? So a lot of times it would be all of that. Like, I want to make money. I want to enjoy my land. I want to have wildlife. Um, but the cool part is, is that proper forest management already kind of does that, right? So then we would work with them um, to kind of develop a plan. Um, you know, a lot of times we would write a full forest management plan for them. Um, and so like a full forest management 
plan include, includes a timber inventory. So we would actually go out and do what we call a timber cruise. Um, and you're taking uh, samples across the property in a, in a grid format. And then you can run that through computer software and it will expand it out across the acreage and tell you, you know, okay, you have X amount of white pine, X amount of red oak, um, you know, on your property. Right, and then you can kind of use those to develop long-term management goals. Um, you know, because that's the one thing with timber is that it's it, it can be viewed as a crop, um, but it's a long rotation crop, right? Where if you're planting corn, you're harvesting corn the same year. Uh, if you're planting a tree, you're harvesting that tree in a hundred years. Um, you know, so kind of working with the landowner to to develop a plan for a timber harvest. And then we would actually go out, uh, mark all the trees that are gonna get cut, lay out skid trails for the logging equipment, um, you know, work out all the pricing for the different timber species with the landowner, um, and then supervise a timber sale, uh, you know, while it was going on with our logging crew there. Um, that's crazy. Cause uh, I had 10 acres out back that's, in forest that was in a forest management plan. Um, yep. It was not kept up with, which it should have been, but it was not. Um, we actually took it out of that forest management plan so that it allows us to do what we want. There's like tax right. penalties if you end it early. Um, that being said, um, when we had inquired about expanding our pasture space, obviously that meant, um, you know, cutting into the woods and, and, and uh, getting that taken out. Um, what was funny is, is we, consulted somebody in forest management and they, they came out and they're like you know people a lot of people think that just because you have a forest that it's you know somebody would come in clear cut it make you know furniture out of it he goes you'd be hard pressed to get a pulp truck in here to take it for free it's like that's yeah. how much shit wood and shit growth we had yeah. in the back there yeah. even though it looks like this lush environment it's actually yeah. a poor, it was a poorly kept up um, forest plan. And, yeah. um, you know, it's hard for animals to be in there because it's, you know, it's thorny or bramble. Um, the trees are half dead because, um, you know, other tree growth is, is you know, taking the nutrients and, and resources away from them. So, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, with everything, yeah. like with, with hunting and fishing, there's, there comes a degree of, of management to then, allow the species to grow be healthy and uh have enough resources in that area yeah no exactly and and kind of like you were saying um you know it's it's so funny so many people like see a big pine tree right and they're like well that's a huge pine tree like that's got to be worth a ton of money but it's like well you don't realize the knots and the limbs on that thing are this big mm -hmm. so it's like when you send it to a sawmill and they go to mill it out, uh, you know, how is that going to make a board without falling apart? Because the knots as wide as the board is, yeah. um, you know, so there's, there's lumber grade standards. And so, you know, it's, it's funny how many times you would go to someone's property, right? They'd be like, oh, yeah, I got all this like huge, like awesome, amazing timber. And you'd go there and it would be all junk. Um, but a lot of that is, um, because of the history of New England, right? So, uh, you know, back in, back in the 1860s, so like, like New Hampshire, for instance, right? Right now, I think is 82 or 83% forested. Um, you know, we're the second most forested state in the, in the U.S. You guys up in Maine are the number one most forested state. You guys are like 1% yeah, of our forest. Yeah, yeah. If we're 82, you guys are 83. So you're like, you know. But, um, but the thing is, if you go back to the mid-1800s, like 1860s, uh, it was exactly the opposite, right? Like New Hampshire would be 82% pasture, um, you know, because it was all sheep farming up here, right? It was too That's rocky. Right. It was too it's rocky to till. Long. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, so, I, I, I can't I believe that. how often I'm like, I'll be like two miles out in the woods, like, like just like two miles out in the woods on this property, and there's a stone wall. 
Yeah. You know, and if there's a stone wall, it was a pasture or a field at one time. And I'm like, how the heck, like, was someone way out here, like, grazing sheep? Me and my father had this conversation. So my property was like 1790 something, right? And, and um, I think it's 1795. I always forget the date. Um, but we have rock walls on rock walls on rock walls throughout yep. the back. And it's funny that, like, now, I, I don't want to get into the whole politics of, of uh, you know, trees and, and not trees. But what was an interesting fact was um, we got to see some old town pictures. And it mm-hmm. was fields as flat. far as you can see, yep. right? It was flat. Yep. It was grass. And, um, yeah, it was just interesting because it's like this was within the past, you know, couple hundred years or hundred years or whatever you want to. Um, whenever that changed over into tree growth and again, unhealthy, unhealthy, yeah. unmanaged forest. Yeah. 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 And so that's what happens is a lot of times old fields, if they're just left, right, they'll grow back into forest. But a lot of times because it's so open, um, different things happen to the trees, right? Like white pines will get white pine weevils. And then that's where you see the multi leadered uh, pine trees instead of just a single stem, um, you know, and that happens because the pines getting too much sunlight, right? If it's yeah. shaded, yeah. the pine weevils don't like it, so they won't be there. Um, so it's yeah, just that like that. That. what's that invasive species for the hemlock that grows underneath the white? Uh, it's like uh, yeah, hemlock, hemlock woolly adelgid. Yeah, yeah. So we we've had to get our trees sprayed recently so that we could at least, you know put it at bay i guess i guess it's a huge invasive species uh to maine and it could potentially eradicate the hemlock as we know it and now they're coming out with like um hemlocks that are scientifically engineered to be resistant to the species but um up in the lakes region which was interesting they said if the hemlock leaves the the lakes region um it'll have serious repercussions on um the fisheries and i was i was like blown away like the two didn't equate like forest water like how the hell are these two uh, equating and um yeah i do you know anything why that the eradication of the hemlock would um equate to like the fisheries population yeah so really like in nature like everything is connected um you know and so everything that happens in a forest affects something else. And forests are actually really important for water quality. Um, And so if like up there, you know, if there's a large component of pure hemlock, right? So like, it's just pure hemlock. There's no other soft, like major softwood cover. If you were to lose all that, the first thing that would happen is that there would be a lot of warming going on on the soil. Right, because a conifer tree, like a hemlock, keeps its needles 365 days of the year and so provides shading on that ground. Um, So that would be providing that. And then, so, you know, if you had hemlocks along, you know, and hemlocks like wetter spots, so you're going to have hemlocks along headwaters of streams, stuff like that. And then if you lose those, now more sunlight's hitting that, those streams. And so that's raising the water temperature of the streams. Um, Another thing just for regular uh, like water quality type stuff is that softwoods are generally better for water quality than hardwoods are. Um, You know, because oaks, like your oaks species have higher tannins in them. Um, You know, so the leaves have tannins, the trees have tannins, the acorns have tannins. and so all that falls on the floor, fo- falls on the forest floor, you know, kind of leaches in and it gets into the water, it can make its way down into the water stream. Um, you know, so like down here around uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, right? Like you think of Manchester, New Hampshire, big city, but their public water supply is a couple of big reservoirs. Um, and so they actually have Manchester Waterworks owns about I think it's like six or 8,000 acres around those watersheds that they manage with forest management. 
to maintain the water quality of their reservoirs. Um, you know, so so how you manage your forests can really dictate your water quality and you know a whole host of other things as well. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah. But <laughs> so this is what you do on a daily basis. You're you're eating, breathing, sleeping trees and 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 uh, yep. now now are you act outside of timber sports are you active in the logging or anything like that or is it more just the planning and uh, yeah at, at this point it's just the planning um when i was working private forestry for that company um i did do during the winter time right when the snow is on the ground it's a little harder to get out and do field work um in the woods so a lot of times i'd end up jumping in a skitter uh or jumping in a slasher and processing wood on the landing um you know so a lot of times in the winter i'd end up jumping on a logging crew and uh you know helping out there um, which i always loved i love the, the opportunity to be able to get an equipment um you know because at the end of the day everyone loves to run big equipment and you know if you're running a big skitter that nothing can stop so I know a lot of machines, but I've never heard the term slasher before. What is it? Yeah, so a slasher, um, it's also kind of like a crane. So if you've ever driven by a log yard, right, where they're actually processing the wood. So a lot of logging crews are what we would call a whole tree operation, right? So they have the fellow buncher that comes in and grabs the tree, cuts it, picks it up, lays it in the ground, puts it in a bundle. Then you have the grapple skitter, which would pull that whole hitch out to the log yard. But now you have those whole trees and something's got to cut them up. Um, so there's the, there's the slasher machine. So it's a big uh, like knuckle boom crane. And so that grabs it. And then it has a delimmer typically on the front. It'll all be set up on basically like a, a log trailer uh, or like a tractor trailer bed. Right. And so it'll have a delimmer on the front and you can pull the trees through the delimmer and it'll automatically take all the limbs off. And then it'll have a big saw. It'll either have a big, huge harvester bar, like a chainsaw bar, or it'll have, we call them hot saws, but it's like a circular saw that runs yeah. all the time that you have it on. Um, and then that has a measuring table. So you'll take the tree, pull it in, you know, you, you'll be looking at the log right because your job is you're processing this into logs so you have to know what the log specs are um and then you have to be able to look at that quickly and be like yep that's a saw log nope this is a pallet log uh you know and then you pull it in for length zip it off um you know set that aside and then so you're just there processing all day processing hitches and then when trucks are coming in and you're loading the trucks or running wood through the chipper to load the chip trucks. Um, yeah, so it's fun, you know, it's a lot of swinging back and forth and uh, it's always crazy because, you know, it, it's, it's like an excavator sort of because you're sitting there, you have joysticks, but in a crane, you have foot pedals for rotating, right? So, you know, you hit your left foot, you'll turn left, you hit your right foot, you'll turn right. So I like never ran an excavator. I always, I learned how to run, you know, a, a log crane and a slasher and stuff. And then one day I had to rent an excavator to do some work at my house. And I was like, guys like, oh yeah, you know how to run this? I'm like, oh yeah, I've run all kinds of equipment, you know, and I get in the thing and I'm like sitting out there, I'm looking like, I'm like some city slicker. Like I'm just, you know, I'm like spinning around and I'm like, you know, every time, cause it's like the operation to like open or close your grapple is like the rotate for an excavator. So I'm like sitting there and I'm like trying to, you know, and I'm like just fighting with the excavator. Cause I'm like, I want to do this. And then I'm like spinning to the side. And it's like, it was like, oh man. <laughs> It's it is it is funny and I, I can't I can't necessarily equate it to something, but um it is funny that you know a lot of times it's easy to teach somebody who has no experience on something yeah. because yeah. you don't have to unlearn what they a lot of times it's bad habits, but it could be a different machine or, or what happens. Oh, yeah. so that's yeah. that's hysterical because like 
it, yep. you're you've learned one way to do something and then you get into another piece of machinery that has similar controls and they have different functions completely. Oh yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. With, with that, it's like if, if you were ever on the landing or at a log yard and someone got in a crane that had a lot of experience running an excavator, you always yeah. stood really far away because the, the control function to spin or, you know, to spin the excavator was the control function to open the grapple and drop whatever was in it, right? So you'd, like, watch someone who, like, always ran an excavator, and they'd, like, pick a log up, and then they'd go to turn, and they'd, like, drop the log from, like, 30 feet up, you know? And so it was, like, if anyone ever ran an excavator, it's, like, stand far away. <laughs> That's hysterical. Yo, and it, was, it was funny because uh, I used to load trucks in the log yard at the office and I always remember you know there was this Canadian trucker who came down and you know Canadian truckers like their their trucks are always just like completely mint like this guy had hardwood floors in his truck you know like it, it was always just spit polished and and uh I like had you know I'd done some crane work but I hadn't Low, officially loaded any trucks yet and he showed up one day and I was the only one there and I was like oh crap and like I was like well my boss will be back soon my boss like wasn't showing up so finally I'm like I'm like I can load you if you want but I'm like I haven't loaded a truck yet you know and he's like oh it'll, it'll be okay you know I think it took me like two hours to load his truck with three tiers of logs and you know he just sat there patiently like he was a good guy like like over my whole career at this company like him and i we got to be really good friends you know but by the end of my time there i could so it took me two hours right like two two and a half hours the first time i loaded his truck by the last by by the end of my career i could load his truck in like 25 minutes <laughs> you know it's just it's great and he he'd like he'd just park his truck next to the crane and he'd go into the office and talk to the secretary and like just let me load his truck like he, he wouldn't even he wouldn't even watch me you know he'd just be like yep yeah, go ahead load my truck that's a start. well that's that's uh that's some good insight into the uh the logging and and forestry management world um i had a unique experience um with Billy. So Billy had invited us up to the Freiburg fair, which is, um, in Maine. And they have a, they have a freaking cat. <laughs> <laughs> they have a, they have an awesome day. Um, about 20,000 people. Um, it's called woodsman's day. And you said upwards of 120 competitors. In yeah, I think there was a little over a hundred competitors there. Yeah. In different disciplines um from you know you know working with skitters to the log trucks to loading them unloading them um billy's specialty is in the the world of axe work and saw work and uh so run us through some of the stuff that you've done there how you're how you're matching up to the competition um how long you've been in the industry and maybe a little bit of insight on what exactly timber sports is yeah yeah no definitely yeah so so kind of one of the things is, is um yeah on on the weekends when i'm not working in the woods then uh then i go and uh chop wood for fun and uh get to call myself a professional lumberjack athlete <laughs> and um yeah so it's basically um you know, it, it, it's kind of a cool sport because it takes a lot of old traditional uh, ways of, you know, the guys would have to fell trees or, or yeah, cut yeah. trees or process them, right? And then putting them into a competitive format, um, you know, and, and we don't use traditional tools anymore, right? We've, we've developed um, tools specifically to do this faster and better. Um, you know, so we're still using axes and uh, we're still using crosscut saws and single block saws, but these things are designed specifically for racing. And we're really picky about the type of wood that we put them in. 
um, because if we were to hit a knot or something with one of those racing tools, we would destroy it. Um, and then you're, you're pretty much out of luck. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, timber sports is kind of a, not only a national thing, um, but it's also a worldwide thing. So, so before, before we get into that, what's the history of timber sports? I heard it, it, it was kind of like a, an old pastime in logging camps. Um, yeah. So basically, yeah, kind of got started. Um, you know, I mean, guys sitting around, what do they do? They, they challenge each other. Right. Yeah. So, you know, these guys are sitting around the logging camps on an evening or on a weekend. Um, and they're like, Oh, like, I bet I could chop through a log faster than you, or I bet I could saw through a log faster than you. Um, you know, and then they'd be like, oh, well, I don't think so, you know, so then they'd be like, okay, well, let's pull up two logs and let's go at this, and, you know, so so that's really how it got started, um, and then at some point, people decided, well, this could be entertainment, and let's bring it down to the county fair, you know, um, and that's kind of how it progressed from there, and then people were like, well, you know, we could make a specialized axe that, you know, you wouldn't want to swing all day in the woods, but like for just racing through a single log could, you know, be way better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's kind of funny because like, I guess like lumberjack sports is something that I feel like, you know, you'd really think, well, like this, this had to have started in the U S um, you know, with like lumberjacks and stuff, but, but it actually started in um, down in Australia is where it started, right? And lumber camps down there is kind of where it got its original start and then kind of progressed out from there. You know, came over to the U.S., came over to Canada. So, Yeah, that's yeah. cool. So, uh, you know, I had asked you where your axes came from, and they're actually not from the U.S., and they're not of a U.S. style. Um, yeah. Uh, give a little background on, on the style of axe you use and – and where where it comes from yep yep yeah so there's there's only i think about four companies that make um competitive racing axes and um pretty much all those companies are in either australia or new zealand um and so one of the most popular uh brands is uh, called tuatahi and they're out of new zealand and um, they just tend to have the best steel. Um, they've been around the longest, so they, they know the tempering to get them just right. And, um, yeah, so most of our axes come from there. Um, I actually buy them as blanks, um, you know, rough ground to the degree that I want. And then I'll actually send them to a guy out in New York, typically, um, that grinds grinds the axes and then we'll put different uh different chisels different uh different types of grinds and hollows behind those grinds um in order to to cut different wood um you know because because depending on the angle of the axe and the edge of the axe and the relief behind that edge uh can all dictate how that axe will penetrate the wood but then also dictates what's almost more important is how the ax comes back out of the wood. Um, because if you have an ax that's cutting really deep and then, but then it sticks and then you have to wrench it out every time it sucks all your energy out and it wastes a bunch of time. Um, now, this may be an comparison, but, uh, a while ago I had asked, um, you know, an ass car driver, how much, how much when you want to win how much is the car how much is the driver and if i remember correctly i think like 80 percent of it is the car and how it's handling and the power and performance and and just how it's dialed and 20 percent is the driver i mean i guess at that level um they're all talented so mm -hmm. um you know obviously there's mix-ups or whatever but mo the majority is like an 80 20 split um when it comes yeah. to using your axe how much is the axe versus how much is the competitor obviously there's a very physical aspect to it not saying that there's not yeah. a physical aspect in nascar yeah. but um would you say that having the axe uh having a you know subpar axe or a c level or b level axe would 
no matter how good of a competitor you are, it's not going to run. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, it's I, I I mean the equipment is very important. I mean you can definitely tell like good equipment from bad equipment, but then the skill level of the competitor is also really important. So yeah. I would I would really have to say maybe like a fifty fifty split. Okay. Or even like a, a 40% equipment, 60% operator, um, you know, even. So it's because, because you could take a really good axe, like I could take a really good axe and hand it to you. And I could take a really crappy axe and we could cut the same size block and I'd still blow you out of the water by my head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally sure. <laughs> yeah, like no like no like beginner's luck. No like <laughs> to do it. No beginner's luck. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I bet Thanks, I'd be really. done and you wouldn't even be on the on the second half of the log yet. I might have to throw down one of these things. <laughs> I might have to embarrass myself. <laughs> All right. Oh, All right. Dead, dead, dead straight face. No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, that's great. But, you know, but it's, it's, this sport is, it's so much about the technique and the presentation, right? Whether, whether you're chopping, it's, it's how you, how you present the ax to the wood. Um, yeah, it sounds it sound like a weird term, but it's like it's like a term in lumberjack sports, right? It's like presenting the axe to the wood, and how you do that is going to dictate how that axe cuts. Um, and it takes a lot to get that right, um, you know. And and it's one of those things of of people always think, oh, the biggest guy is going to win because the biggest guy is the strongest. And it's like, I can beat guys twice my size all the time yeah. because yeah. my technique and my precision and how I'm presenting the ax to the wood is better than their brute strength just trying to get the block off. Um, you know, it's, it's not about strength. It's about, it's about being the most technical, really. Good shit. Good shit. So we, we went over the entire gamut of what Billy does from – from uh, forest management to logging in the early days to now uh, timber sports and and uh, you know looking forward to next season that was that was wild I I enjoyed it thoroughly um, it's it's a nod to the old way I mean still seeing the uh, the horses all yoked up and and uh, you know pulling logs up there this you know the equipment side of things like the precision that some of these guys um with the logging trucks and i mean there oh, were yeah. some big boys running around too <laughs> and then uh you know and it's it's all it's all ages i mean there was some there was some 80 plus out there you know still out there drop they might not be the fastest but you could see the technique um, yeah. yeah male female um and then you guys collaborate too there's like uh in some of the saw races there was uh male and female teams um, yeah so that was super super cool um little known fact billy you hold the record with your wife for what yeah so we hold the record uh the world record for uh two cuts in an eight by eight timber uh for jack and jill cross cut so oh yeah. yeah 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 we set that back in 2018 so does that put yeah. you in the book of world records or no it's just like a, a record book of lumberjack times yeah, it doesn't really get to the Guinness Book of World Records, but uh, yeah. All right, all right. So if uh, anybody wanted to learn more about the sport, um, where are these uh, timber sport uh, events held usually? Is it more in the north? Is it all around the country? What time of year? And then also, um, where can they find you if they wanted to know more about the uh, the forestry or, or your path or kind of wanted to reach out to you? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, timber sports events and lumberjack events are, are really all over the country. Um, 
you know, you can find them in any neck of woods. Um, and a lot of times there, you know, a lot of them will be at different fairs, you know, county fairs, state fairs. Um, some competitions are big enough that they kind of host the competition as an individual event. And then other things are kind of attached onto that. Um, you know, so there's some real big competitions in, you know, West Virginia and New York and Pennsylvania. Um, you know, up here in the New England region, um, probably I would say a third to half of the fairs um, have a lumberjack, some sort of lumberjack competition um, at them. So it's a pretty broad range of uh, events to be able to check it out at. Um, you know, there's also the Steel Timber Sports Series, which, you know, a lot of you guys have probably seen on ESPN or ABC Sports, um, you know, in the past. Um, you can also go to live events there and look them up online. Um, yeah, and then you can find me. Uh, the best place to find me is on Instagram, and uh, my handle there is, is NH Lumberjack. So. Hell yeah. Uh, well, thanks yeah. for coming on the show, Billy. I look forward to next season, and and just hanging out with you it's always a it's always a good time uh at these events you're you're a pretty stand up dude and well respected in the community um thank you very much for for taking this time to to dive into who you are and what you do yeah definitely anytime and uh we'll set up that chopping event and as a special thanks to our loyal listeners, we're giving $10 off your next purchase of $60 or more at BruntWorkWear.com. Use discount code BUCKETTALK10. That's BUCKETTALK10.